you know, I think that we set very um, high expectations for ourselves because we want this for our patients. And we love, uh, we love just knocking off milestones. It's like a checklist to us. We need to get it done. We want to get it done right. And because we've got bigger things on the next goal. So we keep uh, meeting our goals and that's what we focus on. Today, we're diving back into the story of the biotech space and unpacking Imugene. ASXIMU were one of the leading biotech companies and they've had a really prolific range of announcements over this past period with clinical trial progression, as well as a range of different business development initiatives as well. We're always grateful and excited to be joined by Leslie Chong, the CEO and Managing Director of Imugene, and we've got an exciting interview up ahead. Welcome back, Leslie. Hi there. Thanks so much for having me. It is a, always a pleasure. There's a lot for us to unpack, but maybe first and foremost, today we've seen the announcement of Next Horizon. It's your first combination trial. Did you want to give the investors an idea about what this trial is and why it's so important for the Hervax opportunity? So it's called the Next Horizon for the obvious reason. We had the beautiful OS data that came out of Horizon, and that is Hervax in combination with Chemo that um, sort of exceeded our expectation in terms of uh, longevity of life there in, in, a, in the first line gastric. And now what we're moving into is the next horizon. So what can, what can Herbax do next? And I think it's going to be an important study because this is our first combination and this is in combination with pembrolizumab and this is in second or third line gastric cancer patients. So meaning if the patient has come on and some some of them qualify for resections and then they go on to first line therapy and then they fell off the first line standard of care, it's trituzumab, sometimes it's trituzumab in combination with uh, pembrolizumab and then they fell off those and then they come into our study. And so this is where I think our vaccines and viruses shine because we've got a lot of safety and low toxicity. And so in combination, we're hoping that that combination is going to be beautiful, that these patients will have some further longevity of life within their second and third line of therapy. Yeah, it's fantastic to see, particularly for those patients, as you mentioned, who really could use that additional assistance. We'd love to just hear what should uh, people be watching for as the trial progresses? What are those key milestones up ahead? Well, in this study, the Next Horizon study, because it's at a higher dose than what we even used in the Horizon study, so that's the first line. So it's 100 micrograms, where is in the Horizon study, it was 50 micrograms. So it's a higher level of dose. And we know that the more drug that you can put in a patient, the more efficacy that they tend to see and more antibody production, and hopefully that relates to responses. So in that uh, 100 micrograms with Herbax plus pembrolizumab, I'm just hoping that it completely locks down the disease from happening for this patient. So um, hopefully we'll see this very uh, work quite swiftly and fast, and then we'll enroll more patients and see how we go. So it's quite exciting. Very exciting. And we're all hoping for really positive results for the patients out there. Of course, we know about Imugene's expansive pipeline. The oncolytic virus side is exciting. There's been a lot of announcements recently. We did speak to Professor Yuman Fong as well, which we'll link to after this video for investors to check out. But did you want to speak about what's been going on in terms of the oncolytic virus side? Plenty happening. It's, uh, it's massive. And so we've got Vaccinia study. That's the metastatic advanced solid tumor study. Um, we call MAST, and then uh, that's with the parental virus we call vaccinia. That has dose escalated to a higher dose to cohort two, an intratumoral regimen. Not only that, that ungated the opening of uh, the intravenous cohort one. So we'll start enrolling uh, into the IV arm. And it's a extremely important because there is no oncolytic viral therapy to date that showed a scopo effect or working in an intravenous setting. And that could affect a myriad of solid tumors that have had metastasized. So these are advanced patients that have progressed off of prior lines of therapy. They might have some metastatic disease. And at this point, um, IV regimen is likely the only way that we can affect those metastatic metastases. And so I'm really excited that that's, that's opened and we're going to enroll patients very soon onto that cohort. 
Yeah, it's fantastic to see. And obviously with the dose escalation along some of the other aspects of it, it seems so far so good. Things are progressing exactly as, as you'd anticipate. We've had no dose limiting toxicity, a DLT, and that's how you can progress up the chain of escalation. And so we've been able to do that quite swiftly because we've had a lot of patients actually um, screened and wanting to be on the study. So uh, the doctors are quite pleased with the progress and and uh, the company is delighted that we're dose escalating and, and have opened up the intravenous um, arm. For sure. And then we know that the investors always get excited about the mention of OnCarlytics. I'm sure there's plenty of work going on behind closed doors. Can you give us the oh, update gosh. on gosh. So uh, we actually get to um, display all the work that we've been doing for the last um, year or so uh, because one of the biggest um, immunotherapy conferences, it's called SITC, it's the Society of Immunotherapy Cancer, that is, I would relate it to something like a Comic-Con or JP Morgan of conferences for immunotherapy. And so we submitted three abstracts all on on carlytics in various different combinations. And we're, we actually not only submitted three abstracts, but we got accepted. So all three abstracts have been accepted. And so we'll be able to disclose the titles at least and the combination titles um, in October when we're out of embargo. Yeah, it's amazing to see there's evidently plenty going on on the science side. You always say follow the science and the clinical trials and preclinical is working well, but the team you're developing is phenomenal as well. I know the first time we spoke, you mentioned you bring in really smart people who are curious and want to make a difference. You've been doing that significantly. Dr. Jacob DuPont's just joined the non-exec director role, but there's been plenty of appointments as well. Did you want to speak about who you're bringing in and why it's so important for the mission? Well, I think that Dr. Jacob DuPont brings a wealth of clinical development in the cancer space. He has been the franchise head at Genentech at, for Tencentric for atezolizumab. He moved on to um, just uh, NASDAQ listed companies being the chief medical officer and now the global head of R&D, overseeing various different products go through the development path. I would say Dr. Jacob Duplan is one of the major uh, fabric of clinical developers out there. And I am so pleased that he has decided to join us. And then just that generous state of play, as we know, obviously the biotech space has had some difficulties over the past period, but it's not really a share price discussion that we're interested in. It's really the progression that we're seeing and you're continuing to deliver. So I'd love just to ask, how do you think your position now with the last few months of 2022 compared to where you thought you'd be coming into this year and how's it making you feel? Well, that's an interesting question because, you know, obviously I think all of us in the tech or biotech market saw our share price really plummet. And it's it, um, personally, it was depressing because, you know, myself and my shareholders, obviously, you know, we really think that we're developing promising science and we kept delivering and we keep on delivering. And so, yes, yeah, sure. It was disappointing, but I think that the market will pick up again because um, we're doing exactly what we need to do, keeping our head down and developing our product. And that's what we need to focus on at the end of the day. I, I'm going to stand by what I say, follow the science and the value will come. The science has been very exciting. There's obviously a lot to watch. Any final reflections there that you had, Leslie, for shareholders to continue to watch moving forward? Well, I think we, uh, one of the, one of um, a really nice shareholder of mine said, your company or your you know, biotech company is the only one that's really checking off the milestones and just kicking goals. And he he said he, he we were the only one. And I, you know, I think that we set very um, high expectations for ourselves because we want this for our patients. And we love, uh, we love just knocking off milestones. It's like a checklist to us. We need to get it done. We want to get it done right. And because we've got bigger things on the next goal. So we keep uh, meeting our goals and that's what we focus on. Playing in such an important space that can make such a big difference. We're all behind you. That's the Imogene story. It's ASX IMU. If you've enjoyed this video, feel free to share it out. Make sure you've subscribed and turn your bell notifications on. Leslie, it's always a pleasure. Until next time, look forward to chatting soon. Thank you so much for having me.